So hello, everybody. I'm going to immediately share the screen and we'll get with it here. And then there we go. I think that's it. Participants can now see your application. Good. So uh, I want you to really go with me here because I'm going to be talking about something we call the Gospel of Mark. And that is the name in the New Testament. But I would like us to pull it out of the New Testament mentally and even get rid of the title, since the title is, as far as most of us who work on a degree, is not original. It's later in the manuscripts, but it's it's anonymous and it doesn't even have a title. But the first line does say the beginning of the good news of Jesus the Messiah. So if it had a title, that would probably be the title. Now, why do I want you to do that? Because if it's dated, as it usually is, shortly after the destruction of Jerusalem in the summer of 70 CE, here's my argument. Then that means it is the oldest Jewish text emerging uh, after the destruction. Now, Josephus's Jewish War is 73, and that is a Jewish text, and so there could be a close rival, but uh, many of us would put the uh, Gospel of Mark, I'll refer to it as that, but with this preface, uh, still even earlier than 73. Uh, and also Josephus is writing a history and this he's not proposing how to live after 70 AD and follow the God of Israel. So I think I can successfully argue that with all of you who will go with me on the dating. So that's the thesis. Uh, I want to give credit to one of my grad students uh, who has uh, written an MA thesis on this topic. Uh, Jenny Beaumont, she finished uh, just as I retired. I finished up with four of my MA students because I didn't want to leave them hanging. And she wrote on this topic, I'm presenting new material. I work with her on the topic and we work together on the idea, but uh, you can look up her thesis at UNC Charlotte. And I hope she goes on with it. So let me just uh, begin. Now, as a tiny little pause, I, I just always like to do this, as some of you know, who know me from these many years of giving these lectures. And now even more, I want to remember Herschel Shanks. Um, you know, it's just phenomenal what he did beginning in 74, 75 with the first issue of BAR magazine. And then all of the things that he was involved in over those decades, those 40 plus years, he and I became good personal friends, spent many, many times together in his home, at his office, uh, in Israel. Uh, and here we are, one of my favorite pictures, my wife, Lori, took it, that captures uh, the small and the great. I'm just a lowly professor there. You can see on the left of the screen, and there's Herschel leaning over. And the great Fitzmaier and uh, Frank Moorcross discussing the James Ossuary. My first involvement with Herschel was uh, just around 1990-91 as we were releasing the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is in 2002 with the James Ossuary. But, uh, and I think I published the first article of the unpublished scrolls with Michael Wise in Bar Magazine. And many of you live through that, so you know some of the controversy. So let's just remember Herschel and all he did. And Glenn, as he continues uh, his editorship, I've been so impressed with the magazine. And uh, please subscribe. I require my students to subscribe to the Bar Library because it's got 40 years of material, plus, 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 plus. And so uh, if you look at this picture of Jerusalem being destroyed, there's an ebook out free that is just out on the archaeology of Jerusalem that has even more. So to the topic, 
I want to mention a book. You may have never heard of this book. And if you haven't, I hope you will take note. S. S. G. F. Brandon, the author. So we'll just say Brandon. 1951. He was at the University of Manchester in the UK. The Fall of Jerusalem and the Christian Church. A study of the effects of the Jewish overthrow of 70 AD on Christianity. Apparently, he knows you'll realize it's the Jewish overthrow of Jerusalem from the title. And this is the second edition, and you can get it on Amazon. Here's his question. What lies between the authoritative preeminence of the mother church of Jerusalem, the church of James the Just, we call it, and the virtual extinction of both its life and apparently of all its local records? And there is that period between the final letters of Paul in the 50s and the destruction of the of Jerusalem and the temple in the 70s is a sort of a dark age in terms of just what's going on and what happened, and especially after 70, going on into the turn of the century. This is a tremendous book. It's so influential. Uh, I, I read it in graduate school. It changed my life. It changed my understanding. I highly recommend it. Uh, he talks about all of the New Testament literature and how heavily it's affected by the destruction of the Jerusalem uh, once you get past the first letters of Paul. Here's a quick chronology just to refresh you on uh, the scale of things as we kind of tick down. Uh, I'm going to, these are my dates uh, agreed on by many of us who work in the field. So Jesus is crucified in 30 the year 30 CE or AD. In the 50s, we get the seven early letters of Paul, Thessalonians, Galatians, the Corinthian correspondence, Romans, Philippians, and Philemon. 30 to 70 is that Jerusalem church of James the Just that disappeared that I've devoted much of my career to studying. Then August of 70 AD, the Roman devastation of the city as well as the temple, the temple especially. And then 70 CE, the book we're calling today in the New Testament, the Gospel of Mark, because I've got to identify it. So that's the setup. Now, question, how does one follow the God of Israel without Jerusalem and the Jewish temple? Before 70, the Nazarenes, as, you call, as we call them, the followers of Jesus, they're going up to the temple. James the Just is mentioned as praying in the temple. Paul goes to the temple. James, uh, Paul goes up to Jerusalem and meets James and Peter. Uh, you can read about that in Galatians and also in his letters. So, But what about after that? Once Jerusalem fell, so here you have uh, Kathleen and Lean Rittmeyer's wonderful work on the temple. It's in Bar Magazine. If you join the library, you can just get all of this, just beautiful, endless things. Also, there are ebooks about the temple as well that you can even get free without joining the library, but you should join the library. So Herod the Great expansion, he, he, he came to rule in 37, the Emperor Augustus, uh, uh, supported him, and he died in 4 BC, just before, I think, just after the birth of Jesus. I don't know if you realize this or not, but this is the finest building possibly in the entire ancient Mediterranean or Roman world. It's just phenomenal from what we can tell. Today, we call it either the Haram, the Muslims, or the Temple Mount. Jews and Christians refer to it that way. 24 football fields. Many of you have been up there. If you go with me on a tour, I'll always take people up there. 145 acres. Just phenomenal. We have to realize the crisis of this temple falling, of the city being destroyed for all forms of Judaism, including followers of Jesus. Remember, they're Jews. So that's my question. Uh, the Romans celebrated the triumph. Uh, this was this biblical archaeology review copy is, I believe it's May, June 2017. It's too small for me to read, but uh, just going by memory here, 
Stephen Fine and a couple of associates wrote this wonderful article on the Arch of Titus. It's in the Roman Forum. You can see here. Here's the Colosseum. By the way, the Colosseum was built by Jewish slaves as a result of the 70 conquering by Titus and who, the one who became the Emperor Vespasian. And uh, by money, we think, that was uh, booty from the Ark. Here's a close-up of one of the frescoes. And this article in particular is wonderful to look up and read. You can get it. Uh, uh, by joining the library, you can go and look at all the pictures, because this would have been in color. Today, when you see these ancient ruins, you don't get the splendor and the stunning, uh, shocking beauty of, of all the things, including the Temple of Jerusalem that we're talking about. Anyway, Titus was celebrating, uh, and it's the most prominent thing when you go to the Roman Forum, you look up on the hill and he's saying, in effect, I conquered the God of Israel. I conquered Jerusalem. I conquered the wonder of the world. He didn't want to destroy it. It was an accident. Uh, the area was later then turned over to, uh, to, to the worship of uh, Jupiter or Zeus. The Romans minted this coin. You can probably read, uh, even if you don't know Latin, Judea capta, Judah has been captured. Here's a Roman soldier kind of standing triumphantly over the weeping woman who's weeping for Jerusalem. And there's our Emperor Vespasian. Think of this. Uh, actually, let me go back to this before that slide. Think of the loss of the Vatican for Roman Catholics. If there was no more Pope, if there was no more Vatican, Roman Catholicism would no doubt go on. And all over the, and this is just a rough parallel, but it helps you think about it. Uh, if Rome, God forbid, was destroyed and there's no Vatican and there's no city of Rome, just the, the, the church would be so affected. And I think the Jews were affected even more by losing Jerusalem. So just put that in your head. And the question would be, what do you do? What do you do to follow the Torah, the God of Israel, the laws of the Torah, the customs going up to the festivals and so on? So we know there was diaspora Judaism before the fall of the temple. So, of course, I recognize that. And that would be the first thing you might think about. There are Jews all over the Roman world. In fact, uh, there might even be as many outside the Roman world as in, inside the land of Israel. We're just not sure of all of that. And there are synagogues. Now, I use that in air quotes because, you know, there, there are assemblies, you know, the Beit Midrash, the kind of uh, house of assembly or the house of prayer. All the capital cities, lots of the small towns. Corinth had a synagogue. That's the term that's used in the excavations. They found part of the lentil that was on uh, the says synagogue of the Jews. New Testament book of Acts, travels of Paul. He always goes to the synagogue. Here's one of the most interesting synagogues. If you go to Rome, be sure you visit this. Visit Pompeii, but be sure you see this. At Ostia on the port of Rome, built by in the time of Claudius, and you can see significant remains of a Jewish synagogue. So there are synagogues, so you might say, well, what do you mean how to follow the God of Israel? Just go to synagogue, you know, kind of like go to church for Christians. But Jerusalem is the administrative center, the focal point of Judaism world, worldwide, and even if you're in the diaspora, you're going to be coming up to Jerusalem. Uh, Josephus probably exaggerates his numbers, but he claims that up to three million Jews would come for the pilgrim festivals such as Passover, uh, Sukkot in the fall, Shavuot, uh, the day of Pentecost. And you do get the idea even in the New Testament that huge crowds of people from all over the world were coming up to Jerusalem, remember the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. So just because Jews are scattered through the diaspora, we still have this question of how to follow the God of Israel. In the Jewish War of Josephus, we get a traditional breakdown of the different schools of, of Judaism, as we call it. 
most of us in the field like to say Judaisms and emphasize the diversity of the field. I'm sure you know that if you've been following uh, academia and the studies of ancient Judaism and all the advances, Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, and Zealots. Whether the Essenes connect with the scrolls or not, maybe you heard the uh, discussion this morning, which was very, very interesting. Uh, where Charlotte Hempel talked a lot about that, and I think everybody kind of agreed that identification is not so clear, uh, just in terms of a one-on-one -on -one thing. But Pharisees and Sadducees, we know something about zealots are kind of a form of Pharisees, according to Josephus. I would refer you to the Dead Sea Scrolls if you want to know about the Qumran group, at least some of the so-called sectarian scrolls, and that's even not the best word, but some of the Qumran writings, let's call them. But also, if you have uh, the Apocrypha in your Bible, or you can get a hold of it, Wisdom of Solomon gives you a kind of a good feeling for what Pharisees were about, philosophically at least, and then Ben Sirach for the Sadducees. So we have some surviving documents after 70 AD, but in terms of the earliest, this other material is later. So Yohanan ben Zakkai is the rabbi who is carried out of Jerusalem during the siege in a coffin, remember? And he forms the academy at Yavne, or Yamnia, as it's sometimes called in some of the ancient literature. That's rabbis like Gamaliel II, Rabbi Yehoshua, Rabbi Eleazar, very famous rabbis in the Mishnah. But as far as have, we have traditions, but as far as a document, the Mishnah and the Tosefta, even the tractate Pirkei Avot, which is one of the older ones, sayings of the fathers, uh, it basically preserves for us a tradition that Moses gave the Torah to Joshua, who gave it to the elders and the elders to the prophets and the prophets to the men of the great assembly. But the problem is the men of the great assembly are essentially uh, people who uh, are coming, their writings are coming much later. So what about the gospel, Mark? This is the standard theory. I'm going to accept Mark and priority. And I'm going to also caution you that you want to use the oldest texts of Mark. For example, in the one of the oldest texts, Sinaiticus, and there was an article in Bible History Daily just this week on that. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Son of God, is added. And the ending of Mark, if you don't know about this shorter ending, I think this is the authentic ending of Mark. So I'm talking about Mark in our earliest version. You can I have an article on the BAR website or Bass website, the strange ending of the gospel of Mark and why it makes all the difference. You can look at that. So reading Mark as Mark, here's what I want you to do with me, just in your imagination. I want you to make it a historical, less theological kind of document. Now, I put theological in air quotes because, of course, it has theology, if you define theology as, you know, thinking about religion. What about Paula Fredrickson's, Paula Fredrickson's wonderful title, when Christians Were Jews, a book I highly recommend. Uh, this is what I'm talking about. In other words, it's, I'm going to say Mark's not a Christian book. Christians were Jews, and it's a Jewish book. And whether it was written by a Christian or not, the traditions are about a Jew, Jesus of Nazareth, another Jew, John the Baptist, uh, his family, James, uh, Jude, Simon, and Joseph and uh, his mother Mary and Mary Magdalene, and you know, Paul is Jewish and so forth. Seven quick points that I'm going, I'm going to show you these, but just people like to know where you're going, right? So here's where I'm going. I'm going to say it's the first surviving Jewish text after 70. I take it out of the New Testament, let it be what it is because it's so monumental. If it is the first surviving text after 70 AD or CE, we need to pay attention to it. That's really significant. So we won't start with Josephus or at least read Josephus and also read Mark. It's a direct response to the Roman destruction of Jerusalem. And I'm arguing that there's no New Testament. 
there are the letters of Paul, the early letters of Paul, the seven that I mentioned earlier. But Peter's dead. Paul's dead. James, the leader of the Jerusalem church, is dead. And Jesus hasn't come back yet. And remember, Paul said, we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, the parousia, it's called the coming, uh, will rise to meet him. That didn't happen. And now we're past 20 years since Paul wrote that, or maybe exactly about 20 years later. I mean, that's a good deal of time to pass. And uh, people are wondering, uh, is it going to happen or not? There's a reinterpretation of what the kingdom is. And there's a revelation of what's called in Mark, the secret of the kingdom. And it has everything to do with a certain understanding of Judaism. Okay, here are the seven, uh, seven and seven. I like sevens. I'm just playing around here. Uh, I could give 12. I could give 15. I could give five, but let's do seven. Within Mark's post-temple, post-Jerusalem proposal, this Jewish text, the first one we have, proposes how to keep the Sabbath, what to do about ritual purity, affirms the Shema, there's none good but God, and you should keep the mitzvot, the commandments, commends a wise scribe who quotes the Shema and the two great commandments, same as Hillel, same as Ben Zakkai, same as Gamaliel, and says that's more than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices, and people think, oh, that's very Christian. It's not Christian at all. It's exactly what the Pharisees were beginning to sort out as well. We've got the widow's gift to the temple that's more than all other gifts, so you don't even need to be in the temple. There's the destruction of the temple followed by persecution and preaching to all the nations, and that has to be done before the end end can come. There's an end of Jerusalem in the temple in Mark 13, but it's not the end of the age. Now, when Matthew rewrites Mark and when Luke rewrites Mark and uses it as a source. This is all altered and adjusted and is Christianized, but Mark is giving you more what I would call when Christians were Jews. And finally, the coming of, that should be son of man, sorry, son of man, I got to check my typos here, the son of man coming with power, which I don't think is the coming of Jesus in the clouds of heaven in terms of uh, what people call the second coming of Christ. So let's go through these quickly. Let me look at my time here. I got to go really fast because I want to leave you some time, but you'll have this lecture and these slides. Uh, Jesus is criticized in Mark 2 for uh, his disciples were picking grain on the Sabbath, whether it's that it's threshing grain, which is work, or whether it's that they didn't prepare, you shouldn't be doing this technically. Pharisees are deciding one thing, that's wrong, you should prepare ahead of time, and the followers of Jesus are saying, well, actually, the Sabbath is made for people, not people for the Sabbath. That's my loose translation or application, meaning laws are for people, people are not for laws. Now, the Pharisees had a view that actually is very liberal and leans that way, but to actually violate the law and have a kind of situational ethics in this pericope or this story, Mark records it as David broke the law and it was for human need. He was in need and hungry. So he broke the law in terms of this holy bread that only priests could eat. And also that, uh, that uh, Jesus quote, broke the law. So you see Mark is right in your face. He's saying in effect, uh, Oh, you think we broke the law? Well, yeah, sometimes you need to break laws. So that's one major, major thing about keeping the Sabbath. They're, they're keeping the Sabbath, but they're doing it with this interpretive lens, okay? Ritual purity. What really defiles a person? Mark 7, 1 through 23. I'm not going to read all of these because I want to have some time left. What defiles a person? Uh what goes into the mouth does not defile, but what comes out of the heart. This, by the way, thus he declared all foods clean is 
a bad translation. It actually just says cleansing all food. It's not talking about saying you could eat pork and trafe and all of that. It is not saying, it doesn't say thus he declared. That's not in the Greek. It's giving you a biology lesson that if you eat something and it's ritually defiled, there is no temple anymore. So, you know, it's going to come out in the toilet is literally what it's saying. But here are the things that are going to defile you, theft, murder, fornication, adultery, and so forth. So you see, these are kind of building blocks of a new understanding of Judaism. The Pharisees actually agree with some of these, not all of them, because they're more into, they transferred the ritual purity to the table. And here, the disciples of Jesus are wash, are eating with unwashed hands, and uh, he doesn't do that. This one is very interesting uh, when people talk about Jesus is a great teacher. Uh, someone calls him good teacher. What do I do to inherit eternal life? And he says, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. That's kind of shocking. Nobody's good but God. Pointing to the one God. And even Jesus and Mark is the Messiah, but he's not God, as you see here, which would be a very uh, solid Jewish point of view. And then what do you do? You keep the commandments, the mitzvot, don't kill, don't commit adultery, don't steal, and so forth, honor your parents. And so these stories are set in the life of Jesus, but as Mark relates them, they're beginning to tell us how do you follow the God of Israel? Because you want to follow Jesus. So it doesn't matter whether they happen in the life of Jesus or not. Uh, this is the big one. Uh, uh, Mark 12, a wise scribe. By the way, Matthew and Luke take this out. It's too much for Matthew to have the smartest man and the most insightful character in the entire gospel of Mark is a scribe, probably a Pharisee. And he asked, what is the great commandment? And look at this. The first is, hero is, or the Lord our God is one. This is quoted three times a day by observant Jews, even today. And you shall love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And notice this. Jesus saw he answered wisely, and he said, you're not far from the kingdom. And what did he see? That this is more than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. Imagine what he's saying is this replaces the temple. Believe in the Shema, the one God, believe in the Messiah, which Mark wants you to do, and love God with all your heart and love your neighbors yourself and keep the commandments. Uh, it's not Buddhism, sort of Christianity, but not what Christianity became. I'm going to say this is a Jewish proposal. Finally, widow's gift to the temple, finally, in terms of the uh, the temple setting of mark 12 widow's gift to the temple she gave more than all those who came at the festival of passover where you'd have untold amounts of gold and silver being brought from all over the diaspora and then the destruction of the temple jesus says he as they come out of the temple the disciples say look at these beautiful buildings and he says you know not one stone is going to be left on another and then you get this apocalyptic prophecy of the coming of the Son of Man in the clouds of heaven. And I am interpreting this to, uh, based on what he says to the high priest. It's Caiaphas. Are you the Son? Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? He said, I am, and you'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven at the right hand of power and so forth. That this is the manifestation of the power of the Messiah. Jesus has been raised. He's been glorified. Even though Mark doesn't have physical appearances of Jesus, he believes that Jesus has been exalted to heaven. He tells the disciples they will see him. And this destruction of Jerusalem is the Son of Man coming with power. If you look this text up, uh, Daniel 7, uh, 14, it interprets the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven for you as the destruction of of Jerusalem and the people of God taking rule and power and so forth. This particular slide uh, reminds us that even though you could say, yeah, wait a Dr. Tabor, this is, what about Christology? Jesus is the Christ. Did you know Yohanan ben Zakkai and Rabbi Akiba also talked about when the destruction of the temple took place that the Messiah was coming? 
Aqaba even identified Bar, Bar Kosovo as the Messiah. So, you know, just to say Jesus is a Messiah is not making you Christian. Uh, I would reject all of these fixed identifications, Jewish, Christian, Judeo-Christian. It's very confusing. We need to talk about apocalyptic movements as a response in late Second Temple Judaism. Even the oral Torah, I've heard people say, oh, the Pharisees had the oral Torah and the Nazarenes followed the written Torah. Well, they had an oral Torah too because they had to interpret uh, what goes into a person defiles and Sabbath is made for man and so forth. So what I'm wanting you to do is to study all of these texts. Just don't rip it out, but pull Mark out, forget the name, and read it as our earliest proposal of a kind of Judaism following the God of Israel after 70 AD. So here's my blog, jamestaver.com. I am retired now, so I just put up about 100 videos of things I've done for years and years on YouTube. You can find it. I'm going to do it. I'm doing a tour this month, but it's full and it's been full for months. But if you go to blossomingrose.org and there's all my books, I'm going to do one in March. And I, I think I've already got about 20 people. It's not even announced yet, but you can. Uh, look that up and keep up with it and uh, get the books. So that's it. Uh, I actually probably had a little more time because I was thinking I needed to end at five and it's 515. But let's talk about this. I Not just questions, but discussions. Um, I'm going to pick on Kathy. Kathy, what are you? Did you, you listen, right? You've listened to me for years. What do you think me... of... Kathy, you've heard everybody. No, don't ask me. I want to ask you this. What do you, because you're not Jewish, I don't think. What do you think of getting, oh, you know, we, we got over Jesus the Jew, apparently. You know, Vermesh told us, it's okay to say he was a Jew. And I always say in my classes, like first day of class, uh, what was Jesus? And I do this little stick where I go like, was he like, was he, was he Buddha? No, uh, Christian? You know, and they're all laughing finally. And finally I say, let's see, Passover, Sukkot, Quoting the Shema, keeping the, I think it's Jewish, you know, and they finally get the idea. Uh, you, just as a person who's followed all this for years, I'm going to ask you a question. Oh, uh, dear. Kathy, I've been with Kathy since the 90s. We've done this dozens of times together. But do you think, and you're a Christian, do you think we could read these as part of a form of Judaism, despite, we, we know they're later later differences in worshiping Christ and, you know, the Trinity and everything, but what was what would be your feeling about just this idea that the earliest gospel might have been part of this Jewish struggle with what to do with no temple and no Jerusalem? What do well, you think? Well, I agree, because they were christian jews or jewish christians yeah and may i would like i wish we could actually even get rid of the hyphenation because we don't say they were pharisee jews or set you know we say they were jews and so to see it as part of the variety of judaism I, and you look at those seven points it's such an interpretive framework these are the very questions the rabbis were struggling with like what do we do about ritual purity how do we keep the sabbath you know, how do we follow God without the temple, without the sacrifices? And here you have addressed in Mark, this, the one guy, the wise scribe is just amazing. I picture him, he's in the temple and he waves his hand and he says, you know, this is more than all going on here. If you love God and keep the commandments, that would be more than all of this. And Jesus says, you're not far from the kingdom. So the kingdom if he's not far from the kingdom, the kingdom is not the apocalypse coming. It's an understanding of the rule of God and what God really wants. So it's sort of moving to what people later call Christianity. But I want to kind of keep it in the Jewish context. So let me ask you some questions. Okay. What is the relationship, if any, between Mark's gospel and the other post-70 Jewish apocrypha, such as Ezra and Baruch? I think they're struggling with some of the same kinds of questions, um, but because they don't have the kind of magnet figure of Jesus to shape it around, almost like we've got the rabbi, just like the Pharisees had Yohanan ben Zakkai, 
who becomes the head of the academy. You could say Jesus becomes the head of the academy of the Nazarenes, even though he's now gone, but Yohanan ben Zakkai died and he was succeeded by his successors. So I think it, it's not as, I, I don't like the word sectarian because it's like the word cult, but uh, how about party, a party, you know, a Jewish movement or a party, it, those documents, uh, they're very valuable to read. Second Estrus, for example, just looks like, oh, well, Daniel was told this, but actually we're revising our views on that. And, you know, kind of does a reinterpretation of, of uh, how we should view the book of Daniel in terms of the Roman destruction. But in Mark 13 is doing that too. Mark 13 is a reinterpretation of Daniel 7 and Daniel 9 and Daniel 11 mentions the desolating sacrilege and the followers of Jesus reading Mark are deciding that that's all been fulfilled and the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven it doesn't preclude a final end but they're already seeing the triumph you know later Christians would visit Jerusalem and and in a way it was a, a, a kind of nasty version of this they would, I'm talking about in the fourth century, they would stand on the Mount of Olives and look at where the temple once was and kind of have this triumphant feeling that those Jews who killed Christ look at what they have, nothing. We read this in the Church Fathers and some of the pilgrim accounts. But I don't think Mark is, is at that point. It, if you read Mark 13, it's with the sense of uh, sorrow. All these are the beginning of sorrows. It's a horrible time. Also persecution, death, scattering, but you got to endure to the end, you know, in order to be saved. And they're waiting then for the final manifestation. And I think, of course, they do believe that uh, Jesus is going to return. So. so how did Christians in the second and third centuries use Mark's gospel? It gets almost hope. Yeah. It gets almost wholly theologized and Christianized. I know that sounds funny saying Mark gets Christianized since it's our earliest Christian gospel, but Christianized in the sense of later material. Now, it's a problem. Uh, that's why Matthew is first. It's not just because they think Matthew was written first. You know, you have people read Mark first. They're going to be like, what? Jesus said, why do you call me good? There's none good but God, like he didn't even say he was good. I mean, that's, so what does Matthew do with that? Why do you ask me about the good? He just edits it, you see? And you'll find constantly Matthew will soften or alter or like the wise scribe, which I think is the major point maybe of the whole lecture, what he saw, because it says he's not far from the kingdom for seeing that. Matthew just takes that out. It's not even there. He's not going to have a scribe in the temple have the wisdom of what to do when the temple's destroyed. So I think uh, what the church does with them is they Christianize them. And by the way, uh, I wonder who has had this experience. If you read the New Testament, here's my Bible right here, and you start Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you read Matthew. I remember doing this when I was 12 years old. I'm going to read the New Testament. I was a good Christian boy. And I got through Matthew. And when I, you know what? When I got to Mark, I bet you did this, Kathy. I said, I've already read all this. He's just kind of repeating. Oh, I know what Mark is. It's like a real quick version of Matthew. But Matthew's like the gospel. And Mark's like a quick kind of review. And then I got to Luke and I was a little confused because, well, this is like even longer so Mark just got really ignored. It's almost no quotes from Mark ever in the church fathers. Nobody's reading it. Nobody cares about it. And it does have problems, some of which I've just alluded to. For example, when Jesus says, take up a cross and follow, remember who he's talking to. You followers take up a cross and follow. This is the big offense of Mark. So everybody, oh, Jesus died for the sins of the world in Mark. You know, he gives his life as a ransom for many, but then he tells all the followers, and you got to do that too. You have to give your life too, right? In other words, if anyone would follow me, we're headed for the cross. Well, you know, 
The disciples don't get that in Mark at all, ever. By the way, I'll just make this crazy statement. The disciples in Mark never understand anything ever. I know that's dogmatic, but I can't find a place where they ever understand anything ever. So what is he really saying? I think he's saying that the way people are understanding this teaching of Jesus now is not at all what he really taught. And he's trying to put forth the proposal of what it really means to follow Jesus as the rabbi, the teacher, and as the Messiah. But the Messiah is not God. The Messiah, in this text at least, is the one who's going to point you to God. And I don't know if everybody, I, I was hurrying at the end, but in Mark 7, remember the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. Everybody, that's Jesus, Son of Man. Well, read Daniel 7. He gives the interpretation of each thing in that chapter. And you know what? When he gets to that, Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven, he says that's the people of the Most High taking rule and authority. You see? And so it's it, for Mark, it's always collective. Uh, he does have the suffering servant. He does. Very important. Isaiah 53, he quotes it. But he would say the suffering servant is Jesus leading the group to become the suffering servant. Kind of like Bonhoeffer said, you know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. If anyone would follow Christ, he calls him to die. So. Tough so stuff. This is, this is interesting. So put on your what if what if hat. So if the temple had not been destroyed, what would it have been like? Wow, I love questions like that. If the South had won the Civil War, what would America be like? Yeah. <laughs> if ben Franklin had died of a heart attack, the Constitutional Congress would have all fallen apart and we would never have a country. I love questions like that. Um, we never know, but I'm thinking that followers of Jesus would have certainly for a generation, been waiting for him to come. Mark 13, most of us think, is a response to the fall of Jerusalem. Not that it couldn't be expected and predicted from Daniel. Daniel 9 talks about a final evil ruler destroying the city and the sanctuary, just like Antiochus Epiphanes had done. So they're expecting that. But if it didn't come, let's say, all through the Roman Empire, I think the followers of Jesus would have still respected it as, you know, a holy place, but they would have more and more separated from other groups of Jews, uh, and uh, maybe it would be a place of prayer, but I think less and less they would be concerned with ritual purity and with sacrifices, uh, it, but who knows how history goes. But it's a, a great question to ask, I think. Glenn, you want to join us? Sure. Hi, Hi James. James. Yeah. Um, an another good what if what if question for you. Um, and it's a bit speculative, but but how might, you know, I know you've written a lot about Paul. How might Paul have interpreted the temple's destruction? And would it have had an impact on his mission and teachings? Yeah, when, well, with Paul, of course, the first thing you have to do is ask, you know, what sources are you going to allow for Paul in answering the question? And I would just stay with the seven early letters. Every, all the scholars agree on those seven, and there's questions when you get into Colossians and Ephesians that are more Christological, more cosmological, in terms of a pre-existent Jesus and so forth. And even more Christian as a whole. And then you get Timothy and Titus and other things. So if you stay with the seven, um, I think it's really tough because Paul is just absolutely sure in those letters, at least, that the parousia or the return is going to get manifested in his own lifetime. And I don't know if he had a tradition of the temple being destroyed uh, or if he's even reading Daniel that way. Now, in 2 Thessalonians, and it's possible Paul wrote 2 Thessalonians, 
you do have in chapter two a very clear passage that a evil ruler will come sit in the temple of God, claim to be God, and Jesus will destroy him with the brightness of his coming. But Paul never mentions that in the earlier texts. And he goes up to Jerusalem uh, regularly. And if you use some of the sources in the book of Acts, he even partakes in temple rituals and temple rites. But he clearly thinks it's passing away. You know, he, he says, you know, the time is near. Tells people not to get married. Don't go into business. Says if you get married, you can, but I would advise you not to. Don't have children. He's very, very apocalyptic. And Mark, I think, has lived past that and realized what we call the delay of the parousia. Mark is already struggling with the delay of the parousia. And I think people are saying to Mark's community, or what Mark represents, because uh, the name we don't know, but you know what I mean. They're probably saying things like, well, this generation is passing, you know, we're 40 plus years and he he hasn't come yet. And Mark is saying, yeah, but the first thing has happened. The temple has been destroyed. And now we are waiting and living in this time of the end. Uh, but the solution that they propose is, is not so different from how Pharisees also have to struggle with that. And of course, most of our bar people know that what we call Orthodox Judaism today, as it evolved, Halakhic Judaism, the Mishnah, religion of the Mishnah, the Talmud, the Toseftis, is essentially coming from the rabbis. The Dead Sea group and all that they represented uh, didn't seem to have uh, subsequent uh, manifestations. I'm sure they did, but we don't have literature on it. Although, uh, as we're now dating some of the Dead Sea Scrolls into the first century CE, as you discussed this morning with your panelists, you know, maybe we should look for some of that. But I think I agree with Hempel's point about uh, just because it says, oh, our prayers are our sacrifices, doesn't mean you wouldn't respect the sacrifices because they are part of the Torah. And Judaism has always said that. Uh, theoretically today, even the most, you know, liberal Jew liberal halakhic Jews who would not really want to see the temple back with sacrifices. It might be kind of embarrassing, you know, before the world to have this slaughter going on worldwide. They still would say, and in, you know the prayer book, Glenn, uh, it's just full of references to restore the temple and bring the temple back and so forth. Uh, you don't find that in Mark. So that would be a divergence. Uh, and I think the followers of Jesus are saying it's gone and it's never coming back. And the end of the age is coming. And the Pharisees are basically saying uh, it's gone and we can cope. And the, our table is now our sanctuary and our home and our synagogues. But in the last days, it will come. So in that sense, you get something similar what christians do you know we've got very apocalyptic christians jesus is coming in my lifetime to i really don't think about it i'll probably die and i'm more concerned with how i live my life and my family and passing on a heritage so those kinds of options i think are also uh, working in the first century so so can you speculate how mark saw Jesus after his death, did he believe that there was a resurrection? Or was oh, absolutely. he just... Absolutely. The author of Mark sees Jesus as the transfiguration in, in chapter 9 of Mark. It's called, that's what we call it, the that vision on the mountain. I think it was on Mount Hermon, actually. Uh, most of us are coming to see that geographically. You went on my tour, remember, went up to Mount Hermon and kind of talked about that by Caesarea Philippi. It's not Mount Tabor, I'm sorry to say, even though it's my name. So they're up on Mount Hermon. That's a vision of the kingdom of God. You've got Moses, Elijah, Jesus glorified in heavenly glory. Mark certainly believes that has happened to Jesus. But remember what the young man, not the angel, says in the tomb. 
There's no angels. There's no earthquake. There's no declaration. There are no appearances in our earliest copies of Mark. He says, go to the Galilee and you will meet him as he said. Now, one way of taking that is the way John took it. Luke doesn't have anything about the Galilee, but John and Matthew in, in says, oh, they went up to the mountain and they had a vision of Jesus. And But Matthew says, but some doubted. So that's not really impressive, is it? You know, like, yeah, I'm not sure it's him. <laughs> that's what it says in Matthew. Uh, and then he tells them to go preach the gospel and so forth. And John, they're fishing, remember? But there's another gospel that would be much closer to Mark. And uh, Dom Crossan has talked about this a lot, and I, I agree with him, and I think Bart Ehrman as well. The Gospel of Peter, unfortunately, it breaks off. But you know what the last line of the Gospel of Peter says? It says, we wept and cried for seven days. This is Passover. The Jews in the audience will know, oh, yeah, Passover is eight days. <laughs> Well, why would they weep and cry for seven days if he's been appearing to them every day? They're eating together. He's risen. Easter. So here's a tradition, just like Mark, that they're weeping and crying. And Peter says, I'm going fishing, you know, back back to the work. And then it breaks off. Boy, I wish we had the rest. My guess is they went up to Galilee and had some kind of a vision of Jesus in power and glory, like the transfiguration. And I think that's what Mark is hinting at. I learned that from Norman Perrin. It's not unique to me, but lots of us would say that Mark's resurrection is more ascent to heaven and glorification. As you know, I wrote a book on that, you know, Paul's ascent to paradise and all so you follow. In other words, it's not like a corpse got resuscitated and was walking around Jerusalem and we saw the wounds and all that. Mark doesn't care about revived corpses. He would care about Jesus being exalted to the right hand of God and being glorified like Moses and Elijah in a, what we call an apotheosis. And I think that's what the Markan community is looking to. And that would actually fit in with Paul, who's also early, who says when Jesus comes, the followers will also rise up, right, and get instantaneously transformed into these new glorified spirit beings. I think Mark thinks something like that. Uh, that's, I think, the earliest view of the Jesus followers. Okay. Good Lynn, question. You want to take the next one? You know, I think it, it sort of builds off that a little bit. There is evidence that Mark was written for both Jewish uh, and Gentile groups. So what was a non-Jew supposed to do with all this Jewish language and imagery and meaning? Um, and then remembering that Jay Christian Becker asking about uh, Romans too. So yeah, I mean, basically, yeah, yeah, if, this yeah. Very, if, if this is a very Jewish document, how did were pagan Gentiles understanding this? Yeah, well, they've got to turn from idols and serve the living God. Number one, that's Paul, First Thessalonians. So that's the entrance. And then they would commit to live the moral life uh, that could be summarized in the Ten Commandments, I think. Um, I'm not sure how they handled the Sabbath, but like not steal, not lie, not commit adultery. I mean, there's not a lot of question about that. We see that in Mark. We see it in Paul's letters. He's very upset at them in Corinth, for example, because they're not living sexually moral lives. And he talks about you lie and you cheat and you steal and so forth, uh, and that Christ will judge you. But in terms of clean and unclean and rituals and all of the things that the Pharisees began to apply now, not just to the temple, but to the table fellowship, touch not, taste not, handle not, you know, the Mishnaic kinds of things. Clearly, uh, Mark's, you see that in Mark 7, what defiles, a, what defiles a person? And he names, I think it's 12 things that defile. So I imagine they would teach the Gentiles, turn to God, 
believe in Jesus as the glorified Messiah that's been promised throughout Scripture, and uh, follow, don't defile yourself with these things, Mark 7, you know, the list. So it's a kind of a, you know, Judaism, it's difficult to call it Judaism because that has an ism to it that we associate with what the Pharisees were doing. They're the Jews. But Mark may have an idea, much like Paul, that what is it really to be a Jew? Is it to have, as we'd say today, the pedigree, you know, the biological pedigree? Or is it that you've turned to the one God, the creator, and, uh, you know, are living ethically before him? So it's sort of ethical monotheism, as it comes to be called. I think that's what Mark would be for. Therefore, his heroes, by the way, are a centurion who has faith, a Syrophoenician woman. And he says very clearly, the end, the end, end, like Jerusalem is the end, but the end of the end of the age is not coming till you preach this message to all nations. That's in Mark 13. So they, they're spreading the word. I think Mark is pretty Pauline in that sense. So if you tell one of these Markan converts, let's say, just like in Galatians, uh, oh, yeah, that's good. You've turned to, you turned to the one God and you're living a good moral life. But you should also, and then you begin to name, uh, observe this festival and this day and this thing, so forth, you know, the rituals and all the what Paul calls touch not, taste not, handle not. It, Mark seems like he, he is advocating a form of Jewish faith. As somebody jokingly said, maybe you know who it was. If, if people had followed Mark, we wouldn't have needed reform Judaism. Uh, somebody said that once. Because <laughs> he, he was sort of saying, look, it's basically right. You know, Moses, Elijah, the Torah. But you know, we don't need the temple we don't need to worry so much about uh you know what we eat and what we wear and what we put on and so forth but it's it's sort of the heart i i find that a little scary in the sense let me just add this as a caveat i don't want to caricature jews the way they were characterized by christians for centuries as legalistic you know flint-headed kind of we're following God and we have no feeling at all because one of the major things in the Mishnah is called Kavanah, intentionality. And in fact, if you do any of these prayers in the prayer book and you don't have Kavanah, I don't care, three times a day, you have to have intentionality. So we never want to caricature Judaism incorrectly as this you know, rigid, fossilized, that's what happened in the 19th century with Christian studies of Judaism they they read it in the wrong way so mark is not thinking gentiles should uh keep the torah certainly not convert to the torah 